G'day everyone and welcome again to this Hidden Gems webinar. If you can hear a noise, the builders next door have just started their drilling, unfortunately. Um, now what's great about these webinars is that you get access to CEOs, senior executives and or board me, uh, members. Now if I've learned anything myself about uh, the smaller end of the market, understanding who the management is behind the company is really a critical step in an investor's due diligence. And in our experience, these smaller companies and their management teams are generally more receptive towards engaging with investors than larger companies, often as these companies are led by their founders. So before you invest in an area that is you know, historically outperformed, do your own due diligence on management, on that management team behind that tech innovation or resource discovery or life-saving drug. So what better place than to start by asking questions of the CEOs presenting today. Next week, um, next week's webinar is a big one as well. We've got brain chip, immu, uh, immugene, race, oncology, and Ordera headphones. So look out for that. So let's make a start. First up, we have Otto Energy, ASX code OEL. It's got a market cap of around $44 million and a flat return for the last 12 months. The company is an oil and gas exploration and production company with a regional focus on North America. We have with us the executive chairman, CEO and managing director, Mike Altzler. Mike is coming from Georgia in the US, it's 10.30 p.m. Mike, thanks for your time, over to you. And thank you, Tim, and good afternoon and or morning to all of you in Australia. I look forward to my opportunities to be able to uh, come back when the borders are open again. Given the time's limited, I do want to encourage any of you that are, are witness are viewing this opportunity to uh, please go to our website at autoenergy.com where you can learn a lot more about the company, its strategy and its ongoing performance. But over the next 10 minutes, what I intend to do is to go to start with exactly as Tim said, to give you a brief overview of the track record and experience of the management team that drives uh, the auto energy story to give you a sense of the nature of our focus in the Gulf of Mexico onshore and offshore, to briefly touch on our strategy, both fiscally and strategically in terms of leveraging our existing base and growing the company, to give you a sense of the strength of the company through its underlying balance sheet and cost basis, and then to finish with a, an overview or wrap up uh, again of, of a summary of the company's performance. Next slide. As, as required, uh, or as, as, as you can see here, we have a management team that has a significant uh, level of experience that combined with the four members of our technical team making up the eight persons uh, who, who represent auto energy. Uh, we have over 230 some odd years of global experience, but particularly predominant in the Gulf of Mexico, onshore, offshore, and US. With that management team, next slide please. We've been able to uh, focus over the last five years in building the company uh, with its focus on uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Why the Gulf of Mexico? Uh, one, because of our experience base and two, because of the fact that it's a very mature basin and yet it's still very prolific in terms of its opportunities that it represents both onshore in the shelf region in the Mar and in the deep water regions of the Gulf of Mexico. Each of these three areas continue to deliver significant discoveries and continue to deliver significant resources. The second reason to be in the Gulf of Mexico for us is that it's a fantastic place in which to operate. It has low royalty rates. It's got a, a stable fiscal uh, regime. It's, it's got a stable political regime and with limited to control and controllable federal and state regulations in which to operate against. It also comes with an extensive infrastructure that allows us access to multiple markets and in particular, the Gulf of Mexico and Gulf Coast bring a premium to WTI or West Texas Intermediate crude prices. So, so we therefore benefit in an uplift to the quality of the, the product that we're able to produce. Next slide. It's important to, to recognize that the strength of that technical team and management team have enabled us over the last five years to review a significant number of opportunities uh, onshore and offshore Gulf of Mexico. From that, we've been able to evaluate individual prospect opportunities, 
uh, all the way through to companies. And from that, we've been able to uh, capture uh, three significant uh, assets. Next slide, please. Those three assets uh, represent both onshore and offshore Gulf of Mexico. South Marsh Island 71 was our first uh, participation in a major discovery. It is one of the top 10 largest shelf discoveries in, in shelf offshore Gulf of Mexico in the last decade and represents the cornerstone of the company over the last three years in terms of, of delivering uh, its strength to its balance sheet. We subsequently participated in the discovery of the Matagorda County Lightning Field. It's an onshore gas discovery. Again, uh, reflective of the nature of the quality of our technical and commercial team's uh, expertise, we were able to position ourselves to participate in what is another of the largest gas discoveries in the last decade uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, Gulf Coast area. And then finally, we've just entered into uh, an opportunity to develop in the deep water environment, uh, subsea tieback, uh, called the Green Canyon Bullet Well, which came on in October of 2020 and is continuing to be optimized in its performance. These three assets uh, represent, in all, in all cases, we are non-operators. So we are partners with the operators who actually manage the day-to-day -day production, but it enables us to maintain a low cost structure and continue to uh, advance the opportunities to support the uh, partnerships in the development of additional resources. Next slide, please. Not only are they significant resources, but they've been outstanding economic and financial successes. Shown here is the asset performance date track record uh, for South Marsh Island 71. And as you can see, uh, it's a predominantly an oil field and the Lightning is a gas field with condensates. GC21 is oil and gas. The combined success case for those three assets have, represents uh, an IRR of greater than 86, an ROI discounted at uh, greater than two, uh, a PV15 of more than $62 million and a payout against the investments made in that of, of just under four years. So quality assets, that are significant to our abilities to then leverage that in our, our balance sheet and financial performance to target growth for the benefit of developing returns for our shareholders. Next slide. Importantly, these assets also carry with them additional upsides within, within the fields. And that gives us an opportunity to continue to invest now that we've completed the investment in the initial infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico or onshore. We have the fields, the facilities, the pipelines. We now can look at lower cost development of additional resources in each of those. And as you can see, underlying our 1P, 2P and 3P reserve base, we actually have an existing developed resource base of approximately nine years and opportunities to continue to invest in these three fields, which will extend our um, produ produ producing economic life to out, out to 14 years going forward from an economic standpoint. Next slide. This is shown and reflected in terms of both the nature of our continuing growth and our abilities to add production uh, on an annual basis, uh, both past and present, as well as looking forward and uh, on a forward looking basis for one year. And coming with that is, of, of course, uh, a lower capital requirement in which to develop that additional production stream uh, and uh, capturing those additional resources. The importance of that I'll come to in a few moments because it obviously creates increasing free cash available for us to look at the next set of opportunities for growth that will enhance our returns to our shareholders. Next slide. So let's take a moment to uh, let me share with you kind of the, the strength behind uh, those assets and what they've created in terms of our balance sheet. Significantly over the past several years, which have been challenging for the oil and gas industry on a global basis, we've been able to leverage that period of time with the growth in production uh, into uh, significantly challenging the cost structure of the company, uh, both in a direct lifting cost basis and an indirect GNA basis. 
We've taken our overall costs from the originally fully developed costing of $31 a barrel to presently approximately $17 barrel, a barrel and against a backdrop of $64 oil pricing in the world, it gives you a sense of the margins that these assets are able to generate. Particularly important in this is that our actual operating costs uh, are less than $8 a barrel. So the other nine plus dollars a barrel is what we believe will be the investments made from a capital standpoint to develop those additional resources that I mentioned earlier, taking us from nine year productive life to 14 years productive life. So our overall break even cost, if we make no further investments is $8 a barrel against a $64 barrel oil world. Next slide. As you can see this, you know, taking that increase in production on an ongoing basis, we have uh, a small debt facility that's enabled us to be able to invest and develop those resources, which we continuously and are rapidly paying down. We owe $13.8 million remaining on our debt facility. Uh, and we have an, an additional source of funding that can be captured through those facilities for the potential growth opportunities. What it, it's, it's attempting to reflect here is a simple fact that as we've lowered our cost, as oil prices have rebounded, we're creating a significant volume of free cash that's allowing us to take advantage of what is a volatile marketplace but with significant opportunities beginning to come to the market in terms of future investments for capturing growth. Next slide. It's important though to reflect that we are being very disciplined given that there is a significant increase in opportunities starting to emerge from individual prospects all the way through to company acquisitions. The importance of leveraging the strength of our balance sheet, our strong cash flow position, our limited to no debt remaining position against the balance uh, against our balance sheet on where and how we invest our money. And we've been very transparent and, and attempted to be very visible in the nature of the criterion that we're using uh, to continue to evaluate prospects and opportunities to invest our shareholders' money uh, to, to enhance the nature of the return that we're realizing. And that's shown on the right-hand side of this, where we're looking at opportunities with Roches of greater than 15%, ROEs of greater than 15%, discounted return on investments of 15% 15 of greater than 25%, and so on. And what's encouraging is we're starting to see uh, as the industry is emerging from what has been a very difficult two years, the quality of how people have used in, in companies across the board this time of limited investments to develop inventory and prospectivity and are now looking for companies who have cash, who have strong balance sheets like auto to partner with to develop those new resources across the Gulf of Mexico and onshore US. And we, we're well positioned to take advantage of that opportunity. Next slide, please. So bottom line, we have three outstanding assets that are, uh, that are delivering day in and day out, increasing production with lower, lowering costs associated with those barrels that are creating the opportunity for us to leverage our free cash flow and our strong balance sheet to look at how we create value for our shareholders. It's being driven through looking at individual prospects all the way through to companies, but equally we're looking at how we might be able to leverage either the sale of auto assets uh, to acquire uh, other assets with greater potential or to merge ourselves with other companies of like size or larger. Uh, and ultimately with the intent to look at how we return to our shareholders uh, the, the confidence that they've placed in us by, by, by investing in us to, to provide us the resources to be able to create that growth. Next slide. One simple and quick example of that is we took our acreage position in Alaska because we weren't going to be in a development mode. We had a 10.8% interest in a very large block of acreage. We were able to convert that uh, with a pure explorer in Australia, in, in Alaska, excuse me, to the opportunity to um, translate that position into shares within that company, such that it allows us to participate in the future successes of the comp that company's development efforts and activities, plus we've retained an override in the future development. And this is a way in which we can monetize assets that otherwise would be long life and, and high, high cost challenged to be able to be developed within our existing portfolio. Final slide. 
So bottom line, you know, we're in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico region because it is a mature and opportunity rich environment. We have a management team and technical team that's extremely uh, experienced and has a proven track record of being able to identify high quality opportunities to invest. Our base is a balance between gas and oil, and it's all very high margins against the portfolio. It allows us with that strong balance sheet to continue to assess new opportunities and to continue to advance the development of the company from a growth perspective, which in, in the long term will provide significant returns to our shareholders. And with that, Tim, I close. Thank you, Mike. Um, bang on time. Much appreciated. A uh, couple of questions here. Um, you picked up some great assets in, in a prolific basin. How, how did you go about doing that? And, and how were they priced at the time, given the, the volatility in, in the oil price? Well, the strength of our team is its experience uh, with regards to the Gulf of Mexico onshore and offshore. And we did a screening of all of the most prolific salt domes, which are the significant areas of potential developments. And from that, it allowed us to high grade from over 100 salt domes in the Gulf of Mexico to 16. In those 16 salt domes, we identified companies who had captured opportunities, but were either capitally constrained um, in terms of their abilities to develop develop them and we were able to then approach them with that, that opportunity to participate and or share in the risk uh, and obviously the reward potentials and that's led us to be in that that strong position of being able to identify these types of quality assets. And, and um, you showed a slide there reducing the cost of these assets and the cost of oil over time to you and increasing your margin. How, how do you go about reducing those costs? Uh, Threefold, I think one, working with the operators of these three assets, the, the, the reality of the, the marketplace and its environment has created uh, a cost synergies and cost opportunities in which we've been able to leverage the supply chain and that's helped us to reduce direct cost. Indirect cost wise, we've streamlined the size of our organizations. I think like many companies have had to do, we've also streamlined, we've invested heavily on the front end in data uh, to enable us to identify and prospect generate. Now that we have that data, we've had a much lower cost to actually uh, further identify and develop uh, and evaluate prospectivity on a go forward basis. So overall, we've been able to focus on both our indirect uh, GNA costs and to streamline those to the right sizing of the company. Given that we're a non-operator, we don't require a significant organization to manage those assets, but equally we're able to uh, leverage on the direct operating side, uh, the good work of our operating partners and ourselves to leverage the supply chain realities. And Mike, we've got a couple more questions, but we've probably got time for one, if you don't mind. And I know we've got an analyst on online here. Uh, he says this is a strong, you know, strong story on development. Are there any available contractor resources to enact all your plans without delay? So with regards to the supply chain with, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it is a very mature basin and there's a prolific uh, variety of providers of services from drilling services to completion services to infrastructure and pipeline development aspects. From a technical standpoint in terms of resources for us to be able to leverage, we have because of our, our experiences and uh, both technically and commercially in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a long list of people that we can call upon to help support evaluating opportunities uh, to provide external peer assist reviews of those opportunities to ensure they are they meet our criteria and are consistent with the type of investment strategy we've developed. Great, Mike. That's all we have time for. Uh, great story, Otto Energy. Um, enjoy your evening. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have Ad Alta, ASX code 1AD, market cap around $32 million. The stock's had a one year return of up 78%. The company is a clinical stage biotech company that uses its eye body platform to discover and develop next generation protein therapeutics. We have with us the CEO and Managing Director, Tim Oldham. Tim, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today to introduce what I think is a really exciting uh, biotech company and a genuine ca candidate for a, for a hidden gem, as, as is our focus today. Um, 
I've been working in the biotech industry for over 20 years, building businesses with breakthrough technologies, breakthrough products and entering new markets. And so when I had the opportunity to join Adalta 18 months ago, I was thrilled with a company that uh, at the time was focused on a single product, but it had this enormous potential to generate many, many uh, different and breakthrough drugs based on a unique eye body technology. So that's our purpose in life is to generate a portfolio of eye body enabled drugs against debilitating diseases that have challenged our traditional approaches to uh, drug therapeutics. Um, the next slide provides an example of a disease that illustrates why we need these new approaches to drug discovery. Uh, disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a degenerative debilitating lung disease results in progressive decline of respiratory function or lung function, increasing difficulties of breathing. We don't know what causes it, but half of patients will die after less than four years after diagnosis. This is a $3 billion drug market today, but the two drugs on the market actually don't work particularly well. They slow the decline of fibrosis. They slow the decline of respiratory function, but they don't extend life. And they come with some very severe side effects such that most patients can't tolerate these drugs uh, for more than about a year. Um, even worse, as we know with the uh, effect of COVID on, on lung uh, disease and lung function, there's a high likelihood that the burden of fibrotic lung disease is going to increase in the coming years as a result of patients uh, surviving severe COVID. Now, what's the challenge with IPF? Um, there are many diseases where we don't understand the underlying biology, but there are others like IPF where we know that there are plenty of interesting targets for new therapeutics, but we don't know how to address them. And this is the case with uh, IPF. There's a target called CXCR4 that we've been able to identify uh, and design eye bodies against that have proved very challenging for traditional antibodies. So it's a great example of what we call our eye body advantage. So on the next slide, I talk a little bit about the company as a whole. What do we have today? Well, we have this asset creation engine called our iBody platform. And essentially this is a library of 20 billion variants of our, our little iBody uh, scaffolds uh, that can be directed against any target of interest. We've already discovered two assets from this pipeline, uh, from this platform. AD214 is our lead asset. It's been targeted at fibrotic diseases such as IPF that we just spoke about. It's currently a clinical stage asset. It is in phase one clinical trials at the moment, um, addressing initially the $3 billion market for IPF, but with potential in a range of other fibrotic indications, each of which is worth more than a billion dollars today. Our second asset um, is, a, a is addressing a target called Granzyme B. We'll talk more about this later on, uh, but this is being developed in collaboration with multinational company GE Healthcare. In fact, it's fully funded by GE Healthcare. They brought us the target targeting problem and asked us to generate eye bodies against Granzyme B so that they could develop um, PET imaging agents for identifying those patients responding to the amazing new checkpoint inhibitor drugs. Uh, the PET imaging market is a $6.4 billion market. This is a drug essentially in our pipeline for free. It is already generating revenue for us uh, and will continue to do so uh, even before it comes to market. So off that rich, already rich asset pipeline, uh, we have a number of catalysts that help us accelerate our growth into the future. We do, we're not resting on our laurels. This is not just about these two assets. We're planning to significantly expand this product pipeline over the next two to three years, such that by the end of 2023, we aim to have 10 products in our pipeline. Um, we'll add the next two to three of those in the course of the next six to nine months. Uh, in terms of AD214, we've got further phase one clinical data emerging through the course of the remainder of this year. Uh, and once we achieve that data, that will set us up to initiate phase two studies, potentially against a range of indications. It also opens up a first partnering window uh, where we may be able to partner with large pharmaceutical companies to further progress the asset, uh, generating milestones and ultimately future royalties. We've also got milestones coming for the Granzyme B asset with GE Healthcare. Um, towards the end of this year, we, we are hoping to achieve preclinical proof of concept. Uh, we're hoping to add a second collaboration with another company uh, in the middle of this year and add two more targets to our internal pipeline um, by the end of the year as well. 
So let's talk about eye bodies themselves and why are they unique on the next slide. Um, drugs work by engaging what we call a target, a biological target. There's some uh, receptor in, in our bodies uh, that is not working properly. It needs to be kickstarted or it needs to be shut down. Traditionally, we've used small molecules for this as shown on the top left image uh, or cartoon on this page. Uh, these are able to hit many of these targets, but they're not particularly selective and therefore have a lot of off target or side effects. Monoclonal antibodies or antibody therapeutics revolutionized drug discovery 30 years ago. Uh, they've transformed many diseases because they're way more specific, but they're very large molecules. You can see with a central cartoon here and they can't get into all of these nooks and crevices that the small molecules can. So again, there are limitations to what they can do. Eye bodies on the right hand side are a small format what's called a single domain antibody. They're about a 10th of the size of a traditional antibody and they have really long and flexible uh, binding areas that can get into these uh, difficult um, and deep membrane crevices with the same degree of specificity of an antibody, but with the penetration capability of a small molecule. And importantly, we can use these in a whole range of different formats. Uh, they can be a therapeutic in their own right, or we can use them as a, as a GPS tracker, if you like, to deliver a payload or a cargo of, of therapeutic material uh, with a high degree of specificity. Um, so it's this broad capability that gives us the opportunity to create many, many different drugs. If I turn to our lead product, AD214 now, and focus on what it is about fibrotic disease uh, on the next slide, thank you. So the top picture shows what happens when a, a human organ uh, uh, is inflicted by fibrosis. Top image on the left shows a normal human lung, lots of open airway space for gas exchange between the lungs and the bloodstream. In fibrosis, you get scarring just as you do when you cut yourself and, and scarring leads to the deposit of, of a product or collagen. Uh, and that leads to stiffening and thickening of the, of the tissues. And you can see on the right-hand picture how much the, the scarring has decreased the available airway space. And the brown staining in this picture is the increased production of the receptor that we're targeting called CXCR4. In the bottom panel, you can see what we're trying to achieve with our drug AD214. The left image um, shows a normal mouse lung. In the middle, you can see a mouse lung where we've, where we've created fibrosis. Uh, and the purple staining here is collagen now uh, rather than CXCR4. And the right-hand panel, you can see that when we treat with AD214, we get a much more normal tissue architecture retained or returned. So that's what we're trying to achieve overall. And now on the basis of this data, we've been able to move into human clinical trials. And the next slide shows us the preliminary results of single dose studies. So we've now generated data showing that we have an excellent profile from single doses of AD214. We've shown that we engage the CXCR4 receptor, which is obviously the important next step if we're gonna modulate, modulate disease. And importantly, we've shown that we can sustain high levels of receptor occupancy for extended periods of time. What this means is that we can block the receptor for long enough that we can extend dosing intervals to multiple weeks. Um, and so we've now moved this program into a multi-dose study, uh, and this will be the key before we can start moving into patients to study efficacy. If I turn now to our GE asset, our collaboration on immuno-oncology, um, the key here is that immuno-oncology drugs were a novel class of drugs that opened up cancer therapy by essentially reactivating the patient's own immune system to fight the cancer. The problem is that only a small percentage of patients actually respond to these drugs, one in four or one in five. Um, and so there's a great need to identify who those responders are early. And so GE came to us uh, looking for uh, an eye body against a biomarker of response to immuno-oncology drugs. Uh, that happens to be a molecule called Granzyme B. And the idea is that we use the eye body to deliver a radio labeled uh, tracer into the tumors. And if they light up uh, because there's Granzyme B being produced, um, then we know that the patient is responding. This means we can get patients onto the right treatment way, way faster. So the next slide shows the status of this collaboration, bearing in mind that this is a $6.4 billion imaging market. The leading products generate 400 million in sales. Um, GE have funded our discovery program. 
Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced that they had selected a panel of iBodies to move into preclinical development. So we're now uh, developing manufacturing processes and, and conducting studies in cells and in animals to prove that uh, the concept actually works. Uh, we've so far generated a million dollars in revenue from this program and we'll continue to generate revenue as we provide manufacturing support to GE through the preclinical phase. Um, eventually, we'll earn milestones and royalties from this asset uh, as the program uh, gets to market. The next slide outlines our overall business model. Um, it's all about our iBody platform, as we've discussed, and we use that in two ways. We use it to create a pipeline of internal assets, such as AD214, that we develop through to phase one safety studies and then out license to major pharma. Uh, in addition to AD214, we expect to add two more targets into our pipeline in 2021. The second way we exploit the iBody platform is collaborations with external partners like GE. Um, and in this case, uh, we anticipate adding an additional collaboration in 2021. So you can see that we're well on the way now from being a single product company a couple of years ago to five products by the end of this year, which puts us on track for that 10 product pipeline by 2023. And the next slide. Um, so this shows us how to think about um, value at Adalta. Um, we are very much, uh, we think, uh, 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 an interesting investment opportunity right now. Um, the analysts that are covering us uh, are valuing AD214 alone at about $70 million, which is two to three times our current market cap. But in addition to that, we have the value of the external partnerships such as GE and the inherent value of the platform to create more and more assets. Uh, the next slide shows our upcoming milestones. We've got a busy next half of the year, particularly around AD214 as we take it through the remainder of phase one uh, clinical trials and open up that first partnering window. Uh, but also as we start to add the additional products into our pipeline. The next slide covers our uh, corporate um, vital statistics, if you like. Uh, Tim's already covered the uh, return to shareholders over the course of the last year. Uh, we had $6 million in the bank at the end of March, uh, which gets us through a significant part of the next um, uh, uh, set of milestones. And the final slide, uh, really just summarizes why we think uh, Dalta is a, is a great investment uh, for you to consider in your portfolios now. We've got a platform capable of creating value through multiple assets over time. We've got a lead asset with potentially multiple indications. It's a first in class asset and it's in the clinic. We have a second asset that's already partnered with a major multinational company and is generating revenue. Uh, we have a clear vision for how we repeat those processes to generate more drugs. We have a team in place who are all industry expertise uh, we are or in industry experts in their various disciplines. Uh, we're not uh, purely a group of, of founders uh, and we have a very robust near-term uh, catalyst and news flow coming. Uh, so with that, I'll hand back to Tim. Thanks, Tim. Um, quite a few questions here. So, so from a, so an investor gets an understanding of why you target a, a particular drug and disease like fibrosis, what, what's the thinking about why that's first? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And the art for a company like ours with a, with a platform technology is where do you point it? You know, what are the targets you're going to address? So we have a very disciplined approach uh, that I'd love to say we applied to the first one. It was a bit more serendipitous. Uh, it just fits the criteria really well. But we spend a big chunk of time looking at where are the eye bodies going to be specifically advantaged? So we're looking for areas where we know there's a target implicated in disease. We're not a dis target discovery company. We'll leave that to academic researchers. Um, and then we want to know that you can't hit it with a traditional antibody or a small molecule. So we want to be able to develop the case that says people have tried with this in the past. We know the target works, but we haven't been able to drug it effectively. And when you put all of that together, you get a target that the, the eye body is particularly advantaged for. On top of that, for our internal pipeline, we're focused on fibrosis, in inflammation and oncology because they're the disease areas we've learned through the first product. And um, you, you're obviously targeting many drugs across your platform. Are there, are there any similar companies that have been very successful with this sort of strategy? So the poster child for our sector actually is a company called Ablinx. Um, they were probably the first single domain antibody company. There are still only about a dozen of us out there, um, all with slightly different focuses. Um, Ablinx got their first product to the clinic in 2007. So they're about a 10, 12 years ahead of us. Uh, they were eventually acquired by Sanofi uh, 10 years later for $5 billion US dollars, which was a tenfold multiple on all the capital that had been raised along the way. Uh, and they'd progressively done about 
eight deals in that time frame with multinational pharma companies. Uh, and they had about 30 products in preclinical development and about uh, eight in clinical development uh, by the time Sanofi bought them. That's a significant price. Um, just a question here, would uh, GE enter into a JV or is it just a question of licensing with them? Um, so in this case, effectively, it is a co-development arrangement. They brought us a target. They paid us to do the discovery work. Um, uh, and they're now doing most of the preclinical work, but it's a very much a collaboration while we work through the manufacturing um, of the eye bodies to support their uh, radiochemistry and, and preclinical. Um, technically, it's a co-development arrangement. Um, it's not a formal JV, but it's very much a collaboration as opposed to we do the work and then hand it over to them. And just one last question, um, given the nature of your technology and the number of drug candidates you can produce, what is Ad Alter's view on the perfect time to license a drug? Um, look, at the moment, it's probably um, uh, once we've got clinical uh, safety data and ideally with an efficacy signal, um, which is why we're developing a PET uh, imaging version of AD214 as well to go into a phase 1B protocol so we can get some more additional data other than safety to support licensing. Um, we'll contemplate it uh, anywhere from uh, preclinical proof of concept through to phase 2, but phase 1 really is the sweet spot for us. Great, Tim. That's all we have time for. Have a nice weekend. Love to get you back on the, on the webinar series um, later in the year. Look forward to it, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Horizon Minerals, ASX code HRZ, market cap of around 77 million. The stock's had a one-year return of up 9%. The company is an emerging mid-tier gold producer with an extensive portfolio of gold projects located in the heart of the world-class class. class West Australian Goldfields. We have with us uh, Managing Director, John Price. John, over to you. Thanks, Tim, and uh, g'day everybody. And, and thanks uh, for allowing me the opportunity to give you an update on the Horizon Mineral story. Uh, the presentation you're about to see is on the ASX, uh, ticker code HRZ, and on our website, horizonminerals.com.au. Uh, so Horizon, what are we? we we're an explorer uh, and we're an emerging developer and producer uh, and we're focused in the Western Australian gold fields, so world-class uh, part of the world to be looking for gold, developing and producing. We currently have just over 1 million ounces in mineral resource. Uh, importantly, uh, over 70% of that is in the measured and indicated uh, jork category, awaiting conversion through to reserve. A very dominant uh, land holding, all within 75 kilometres of Kalgoorlie Boulder. Uh, so we are looking for a centralised hub uh, supported by a base load feed and then a number of satellite operations to get us into production uh, through the next uh, calendar year. Very strong uh, balance sheet and we've just been working on our largest ever drilling program from reserve conversion drilling through to new discovery drilling. Uh, next slide, thank you. And again. So the snapshot uh, there, you can see my current market cap around uh, 77 million. Uh, we have $12.5 million in cash and 5 million in listed investments. We have no debt uh, and we have a very strong uh, technical and corporate team uh, led by Ashok Parekh, uh, a well-known uh, corporate finance entrepreneur in Kalgoorlie Boulder, Peter Bilby, mining engineer and current chair of Independence Group, myself a metallurgist by profession, uh, and Grant, Julian and David, uh, mining engineering, corporate finance and geology. So a very strong technical group uh, and very tight uh, with, uh, you know, very low overheads. And, and for us, it's putting as much money into the ground as possible and, and, and growing our business. Thank you. Next slide. So the project overview, you can see on the map on the right-hand side, uh, everything in red is owned by Horizon 100%. You can see the super pit. Uh, we essentially surround the super pit. And we have a number of key deposits. Uh, the base load feedstock at Barara, uh, just off to the right of the super pit, and uh, five odd uh, satellite operations that we're bringing in. And if I move to the next slide, I'll take you through the, the, the overarching strategy of, of what we want to do. So we're working on a very conventional growth strategy. We want to have developed an initial five to seven year mine plan. That is underpinned by a base load feed, which is the Barara ore body with a current 450,000 ounce resource at 1.3, low strip ratio, very good metallurgy. And that's where we have um, designed the mill. It's a 1.5 million ton per annum, a conventional processing circuit that will sit right next to that uh, main base load ore body with power, water, licenses, uh, all in 
uh, good shape for a development decision at the end of this calendar year. So supporting Barara around a million tonne a year is 500,000 tonnes per annum coming from a number of open cut and underground satellite operations. And you can see them listed there in the graphic. Um, Teal, Binduli, Calpini and Rose Hill all have a higher grade, all in close proximity to the centralised mill. So we're working on uh, our feasibility study to consolidate all the updated resources and reserves to be in a position at the end of this calendar year to make a development decision for that five to seven year initial mine life uh, at around the 60 to 70,000 ounce per annum rate. Uh, and we see a lot of opportunity to grow the business organically uh, to that 100,000 ounce per annum uh, target uh, through uh, the oncoming year. Next slide, thank you. So Barara, uh, we, we're in a unique uh, environment in Kalgoorlie Boulder where we could actually trial Barara, the asset, before we committed to the larger scale development. So not only uh, did that trial generate $3.6 million in cash, more importantly for us, it actually de-risked the project and allowed us to understand the geology, to know that day in, day out, uh, the grade is going to come out of the ground as modelled. So we were very happy with the trial. The metallurgical performance was excellent. Uh, the geological reconciliation was excellent. Uh, and that enabled us to update our uh, independent resource estimate uh, to that 450,000 ounce mark. So that provides a very solid de-risked base load feedstock, uh, which will be the, the mine life generator uh, on top of our satellite operation. Thank you. The Barara ore body at the moment on the right hand side is in the middle of the page. You can see 1.5 kilometres of strike length. We own over 25 kilometres of strike length. And uh, the task now is to look for near mine extensions. It's a fantastic geological setting uh, for finding more gold. And we think, you know, we're going to be in this Barara, greater Barara area from the south to Golden Ridge all the way up to the uh, Canal Bell mine. Uh, it just needs drilling. Is the gold field tired and, and well drilled? The answer is no, particularly below 90 to 100 metres of depth. And that's our focus. And we are currently putting 13,000 metres of drilling into this project area uh, as near mine extensions and new discoveries. Thank you. I won't talk about the next three or four slides in a lot of detail. Uh, I'd encourage you to have a look through at your leisure, uh, but we have very strong, very good grade, open cut and underground uh, satellite deposits that can complement and support the, the base load feed at Barara. So I'll just move through those slides, thanks, through to slide 15 and talk about uh, our most recent uh, acquisition. Uh, next one, thank you, is the Canon uh, Gold Deposit. So, you know, we've been acquiring assets over time and uh, we'll continue to do so. And the Canon is a great example of a, of a fantastic acquisition. It has a development ready underground running 5.2 grams a tonne. It has uh, it's seven kilometres away from the centralised Barara plant. You can see on the image there with, with a fantastic uh, uh, expiration upside. And we're going to be completing this transaction over the next uh, 30 days and then moving the rigs into this area to look for not only underground extensions, but uh, strike extensions along the Bulong South uh, area and Glandor and Kiwana. Thank you. Petty's Find uh, was a joint venture we entered into uh, this year as well. Uh, this is a great and unique opportunity to be actually moving into production. Uh, it has a fantastic resource and reserve, uh, seven gram underground ore body. Uh, it has licensed for underground development. It has a toll mill agreement already in place. So our plan with Penny's Find and our JV partner, Almanex, is to get this ready for development in the September quarter this year, move into a decline development in the December quarter and be producing from this asset as we are working with our feasibility study in parallel. So I don't know too many companies that can actually be in production as we have been over the last three or four years, avoiding dilution to shareholders and generating cash to fund um, you know, the, some of the equity component as we move into uh, development and project financing. Thank you. On the exploration side, we have fantastic 1100 square kilometres of, of tenure on major geological structures in a world-class gold producing gold field. Uh, it's where we've all been for the last 20 or 30 years. We've stuck to our knitting in this area because it has so much uh, more to give. So we are embarking this year on 50,000 metres of new discovery and resource, new 
you know, resource drilling, and that is about a half of the way through. Uh, the challenging part uh, for us right now is the delays in assay turnaround time. So uh, that is going to lead to a massive amount of news flow over the next six to nine months. Uh, we're seeing about a six to seven week uh, assay turnaround, which in turn delays some of the resources and reserves, uh, but it, it generates an enormous amount of news flow. And we've been having up to four drill rigs, uh, air core, arsenic and diamond on the property. Thank you. This is a great example, and uh, we've released some new results uh, recently, and uh, there's some fantastic grade here, very shallow. How has this not been found yet? Uh, it's because it's had multiple ownership over a number of years. We've consolidated it at asset level, and we're out systematically uh, generating targets and then testing those targets with Aircore, following up with RC. So this is a great example of finding something brand new in the gold fields. And there's a lot more drilling uh, we're looking forward to doing in the wind daddy area over the next uh, six to nine months. Next slide, thank you. So that's the gold side. And I think, uh, again, we're, we're in a unique position where we have uh, exposure for our shareholders in a number of different commodities. We have one of the world's largest oxide vanadium projects in joint venture in central Queensland with our JV partner, RVT. They've completed a PFS. The vanadium price is starting to move uh, higher and we're starting to see an enormous opportunity here for exposing ourselves to vanadium. Uh, and getting this thing into production for not only the steel industry, but certainly the emerging uh, vanadium redox battery market and, uh, and the energy metals of the future. On top of that, we have a 20 million ounce silver zinc deposit right next to Barara. Uh, that DFS is now being dusted off and worked on. Uh, so again, exposure for our shareholders to not only our emerging gold business, but uh, silver, zinc, um, vanadium, gold, and... Um, and also copper with our Nanadi well investment and, uh, and uranium and gold. So a lot of different exposure, uh, but our focus and our, our without distraction um, goal is to get our gold business up and away at the end of this calendar year. Next slide, thank you. Timeline and our milestones, uh, again, it's all about news flow and more news flow. So uh, an enormous amount of drilling results to come to market over the next six to nine months. We have new resource updates coming out. Barara is complete, Rose Hill is complete. We'll have Binduli Till and Calpini coming, uh, moving through to the end of this calendar year where we want to complete that consolidated feasibility study, be making a development decision and be moving into production uh, at the back end of 22, early 23. So a lot to come. Thank you, next slide. So in summary, uh, I think uh, a very experienced board um, that's sticking to its knitting and, and, and concentrating all of our experience and effort into building a gold business within a 75 kilometer radius of Kalgoorlie with a centralized processing plant. Very strong balance sheet. We are fully funded all the way through to that development decision. Uh, one of the best strategic land holdings in the Kalgoorlie Boulder area and a market cap of 77 million, which is about a $60 EV per resource ounce, uh, which compared to our peers, is quite uh, compelling. Uh, our shareholders have exposure to our emerging gold business and particularly to our other uh, non-gold commodities that we will look to monetize and minimize shareholder uh, dilution as we move into the next phase of, uh, of financing uh, a processing plant. And with that, um, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, John. Um there's obviously lots of cycles you see and um, you've been in the game for some time. How, how busy is it out there at the moment in terms of getting access to, to rigs? You, you spoke about what's going on in the labs. What about the pricing of the assets that you're looking to pick up as well? Yeah, I think uh, with the gold price sort of um, where it is and, and, you know, the consensus view that it's going to stay where it is or get better, the uh, access to drilling rigs is, is difficult, uh, but doable. The, the prices of those drilling rigs have, have stayed relatively competitive. I think labour is one of the biggest issues that are facing us. So we have access to rigs and we have access to the technical people, but what we're finding is the, the general labour market, drillers, drillers, offsiders, uh, people that can work in labs and do the sample prep, that is an issue that's facing us uh, and I think probably facing everyone in Australia at the moment in the, in the current environment. So uh, we are getting access to our rigs. We've got long run contracts with fantastic drilling companies and uh, the issue we all have at the moment is, uh, is arms and legs and, and labour in general. And um, you've made divestments in the past. You've got a lot of different assets, different commodities. Is, is that a way of realising uh, value uh, in regards to what you've done for shareholders in the past? 
Yeah, so we've been in production and we've been divesting where it makes sense to generate cash uh, to avoid dilution to shareholders wherever possible. So that will continue. Our non-gold assets uh, uh, can be a source of funding for our, our gold business. But uh, we, we like to think we're pretty good at gold. We don't pretend to know about all other commodities. Uh, and um, in time, uh, at the right price, we will move those on and, and use those funds to, to get our gold business up and away to that 100,000 ounce per annum mark or better. Uh, another question here, what's the best way forward? Is it best to kind of aggregate ore feed for existing third-party mills with spare capacity or to build your, your own plant or to do both? I think uh, every time we run the numbers, uh, it's telling us that a mill needs to be sitting right next to Barara base load feed. Uh, third party mills don't have a lot of capacity at the moment with a lot of uh, people putting dirt into those, uh, those third party toll mills. And the margin that uh, we are giving away uh, for use of another person's mill is significant. So the operating cost when we, when we buy a spot into a toll mill versus our own mill is very significant to the to the order of three or four hundred thousand dollars an ounce on our cost base. So, for us, it's it's getting the mine life right, getting a five to seven year plan, and then uh, hitting the button on a on a mill. We've got it costed, we've got it designed, and uh, there'll be a lot of news coming out on that front over the next three months. And and your hedging policy. Just the last question on that. Yeah, hedging, uh, it'll come up in discussion, no doubt, through the financing phase on the debt side. Uh, for us, our strategy is hedging is for risk management and risk management only. And uh, we would see that uh, a, a modest amount, 25 to 30% of hedging is the right uh, risk structure uh, for the business as we see it, uh, but also maximising exposure to spot price, which is uh, you know, a lot of the feedback we get from current shareholders. John Price, thanks for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, lastly, we have Latin Resources, ASX code LRS, market cap around $84 million, a lazy one-year return of up 1,200%, sorry, 1,100%. The company is an Australian-based mineral expor exploration company with several min mineral resource projects in Latin America and Australia. We have with us the Exploration Manager, Tony Greenway. Tony, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim, and uh, look, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to talk to everyone today. Um, so, as you say, Latin, uh, Latin Resources is a diversified ex um, exploration company. We have assets here in Australia, um, over in South America, um, with a couple of projects in Peru and a hard rock lithium project in Argentina. Um, but uh, and mostly, I'll be talking to you about uh, our Nuremberg project here in uh, Western Australia. But we also have a number of um, gold assets over in the um, in New South Wales, in the Lachlan Fold Belt over there. But as I said, this talk will really be focused on our Newbenberry Halosite uh, project here in WA, where we've just released um, our maiden chalk resource on that. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, Newbenberry is a, is a soft rock halosite kaolin um, uh, deposit. Um, we've just released, as I said, a chalk resource on that. We've called our, our initial uh, deposit there the Cloud9 deposit. Um, and it's a compelling opportunity um, as it's, this is one of Australia's few naturally occurring halosite projects. And you can see it's just located uh, just to the east of Perth out there, about 300 kilometres in fact, just to the south of the town of Meriden. Um, we have the main uh, Great uh, Eastern Highway or Eastern Highway running through the, um, uh, the project area. We've got rail running through the area, power and water, so in terms of infrastructure, very well placed. Um, and of course, we've got the town of Kalgoorlie, just about 300 kilometres further east, which is a, obviously a major um, a mining centre with all of the uh, associated services uh, with that. Now, the project itself is, is um, situated in um, wheat fields. You can see the uh, photo in the left hand side there. Um, so, very easy access. We've got good relationships with all of our farmers out there. Um, that is, in fact, our first drill hole that we built on the project towards the end of last year in that photo. Um, so it's literally very easy to get in and around the project and uh, makes life uh, <laughs> very easy for our, our fuel teams out there. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so jumping straight into the resource itself, we announced just on Monday um, our initial maiden chalk resource out there. And you can see that's coming in at 207 million tonnes, which is a fantastic result for us. Um, it's comprised of two main zones. Um, there's 123 million tonnes in uh, a kaolin bearing material there 
and 84 million tonnes in a halosite kaolin material. And they're very distinct and separate zones within that main 207 million tonne ore body. Um, from that, uh, that 207 million tonnes is the uh, full ore body. So it contains the clay minerals that we've been looking for here, um, as well as um, you know, some waste materials, quartz, et cetera. So we get about 42% of that reporting through to um, the minus 45 micron, which is our product specimen um, grain in you know, a size fraction that we look for there. So it's about 73 million tonnes of bright white kaolin um, using a 75 ISO bypass cutoff, or 29 million tonnes um, using an 80, uh, 80 ISO uh, brightness cutoff. And that's a really good product spec and that gets us up to 82 brightness, which is um, certainly what, you know, what we're looking for in terms of um, that type of material. Uh, when we look at the halosite uh, zone itself, um, that contains about 50 million tonnes at 6% halosite, um, using the 1% cutoff or um, 27 million tonnes at 8% halosite. So again, this is a really good result for us. You need to remember that this is the, uh, the very first resource we have on this. So um, it's a global resource, so our grades are very much smooth um, and uh, just looking at a broader, um, a broader resource. So as we get further into this, um, this deposit and we drill it out further, we'll be able to tease out some of the, uh, the higher grade zones within that. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, this is the drilling that we've done. We've completed about 197 uh, holes just over 4,000 metres of drilling. And that was done in the late, uh, late last year um, at a 400 metre centre. And then we stopped for Christmas and went straight back in, in the new year this year uh, to finish that off. And something that's quite important to note there is you can see that we've actually stopped drilling on farm boundaries. Um, that's you know, due to our access. We now have our access out beyond that farm. Our ore body is not constrained by that drilling. It is open in all directions. Um, and we'll be looking to extend that resource um, uh, in the very near future. Um, what's also very important to know here um, is that when you look at some of the results that we're getting out of the, the drilling that we've got there, you can see some very high grades, 26 metres at 24% halosite, um, 8 metres at 35% halosite, and uh, down at the bottom there in NBA, uh, 159, um, 4 metres at 44% halosite. So these are really extremely high grades, um, and they're not really reflected in our resource at the moment, because as I said, it's a global resource. Uh, so those high grade zones are certainly smoothed out. Um, and uh, we'll look to tease some of those out as we go forward. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, geology here is very simple. Um, you can see there's a, in, in the cross section, there's a granite basement that underlies the entire area there. Um, we've got about five metres or less than that of, of soil cover. Um, and then into that um, kaolinized granite, which is that yellow zone through there that we're looking at. Um, the, the image on the right hand side there is very typical of what we see out there. You can see that sort of five to six metres of soil cover, then into those bright white clays, um, and that is composed, as I said, about 40% clay material and about 60% of these other um, relic um, uh, material from the granite, most of the quartz, a few other bits and pieces in there. So, again, that's very typical, and then we go into our um, uh, granite basement through there. So the fact that we've got such um, shallow coverage is, is a real positive for this project um, and uh, certainly bodes well for future development. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, what I've got here is uh, just, I guess, a bit of a trying to represent the two different zones. As I said, that we've got here the, um, the cross sections on the right-hand side there. Um, you can see the red zones there are halosite um, and the yellow zones are more kale and rich zones. Um, and again, they all, they're sort of mutually exclusive from one another. They sort of sit in that same um, uh, kaolinized granite zone, uh, but we do see a, a distinct separation of the holosite material, and that certainly looks to be sitting closer to the basement material. Um, and uh, that, that's fairly consistent across what we're seeing in our drilling. Um, so what actually is, what actually is holosite? It's a bit of an uh, interesting um, a commodity. Um, so kaolin obviously is a weathering product from uh, the granite and the, the feldspars within that and the scanning electron microscope image on the right there. You can see those flat plates of, of kaolin um, and uh, on the right hand side there uh, is the halosite and this is effectively just it's the same mineral um, with a bit of water, uh, less water in, in the uh, crystal matrix and they roll up into these tubes. Um, what's really good about our Nethervery project is the high aspect ratio, which is the length of those tubes to the diameter of them. Um, this is certainly very favourable in some of the um, 
the back end users for the Hawaii site. Um, so that's really encouraging to see that again. Um, next slide, please. So just looking at, I guess, a bit more at the, the resource itself, the image on the right there is a distribution of the, um, the halosite grade. Um, and again, you can see that we're um, drilling all of it, all grade all the way up to the boundaries and where we've drilled to this all body is open to the north, um, to the south, and to the east and the west. Um, and importantly there is some of those sort of dark red blocks, dark reddish blocks in the middle there. Uh, we know this is where we're getting um, in our drilling, some of the plus 20% high site in those areas. Um, and again, because of this is an inferred resource at an early stage, we haven't been able to tease those zones out. So our next round of drilling will go back in and, and look to focus on those zones um, and, uh, and pull them out. Um, so we can report those out, those out separately. Um, the two sections on the, uh, the left hand side there, again, the top one is um, uh, brightness and the bottom one is um, grade of hello site. And you can see again, there's a very distinct separation in between the two zones with the purples and the, uh, the reds in the top image there showing the high brightness material, which is the favourable Kaolin product. Um, and in the bottom there, you can see that band of red um, down the bottom there, which is um, the uh, higher grade hello site. So, quite distinctly different and again sitting on the base of the, uh, the granite there, down there. Next slide please. So what are these things actually used for? Um, you know, again, we, we get this question a lot, um, you know, what is the end product used? And certainly kale in there is, should be well known to people. It's a, it's a pigment that's used in paper and ceramics, and paints and plastics, um, et cetera. Um, and what you're looking for there is high brightness. So the, the minimum product spec is around that 75 ISO brightness. And when you're getting up to where we are in around 80 and plus 82, um, right up to you know, 84 brightness. These are really high quality products and certainly look well sought after in the uh, in that Kaolin market. For HelloSite, this is, a, a, I guess, an emerging technology and it's certainly got a lot of interest and a lot of usage in um, things like hydrogen storage, carbon capture, um, supercapacitors and these type of things. Also nanotube technologies for delivery systems for pesticides and things like that. There's also um, a bit of research coming on at the moment in terms of um, the addition of halosite into cements and concrete to increase the strength of those and, and things like that. So that, that, that halosite uh, market is certainly very emerging at the moment, whereas the kaolin is, is quite well understood um, and, and there's a good base in that. And you can see there on the right hand side that global kaolin market. It's around about five and a half billion dollars in 2013 and looking to get up to around about eight billion dollars in by 2024. So significant growth through there um, and uh, you know a very strong market indeed for, for those products. Uh, next slide please. Okay so just looking I guess at the project in a bit sort of wider scale you can see the uh, in, in the right hand side there our drilling again and our resource contained within that one exploration license that we have. Um, as I said, our drilling is constrained by a farm boundary there only. Um, our wall body continues on to the north um, and to the south, east and west. Um, we've got an extensive tenement package there, um, you know, covering 560 odd square kilometres and 105 kilometres of strike from north to south. You can see it in that image on the left hand side. Um, most of those tenements are still under application. We have three granted tenements now. That one down to the south has only just been granted very recently, which is great which means we can start working on, uh, on that area now as well. Um, we have done some work up to the north um, east from uh, the resource area, and you can see there's a couple of rock chips that we've taken up there. We've gone and sampled some of the local dams, um, and they're coming back with, again, high, very high brightness at greater than 84 ISOB and 25% holocyte. So we know there's more of this material along strike. Um, it's just now a matter for us to start stepping out um, and uh, expanding on what we've got so far. Uh, next slide, please. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Um, you can see that area in the red um, uh, hatching there. That's our next phase of drilling. That is around about the same size um, uh, area-wise uh, that our current resource is in, and we'll be into that um, in about two weeks' time. Um, we'll be heading back on site. The rig's already lined up. Our geos are ready to go, and they're heading out um, in literally a week's time to start pegging for that. Uh, that's our a separate farm that we've uh, got an, an access agreement with now. Um, all of our farmers have been very accommodating, so that's certainly really encouraging for us and really help, our, help us getting on the ground out there. Um, so we'll be getting onto that to extend our resource. We'll also be doing some uh, infield drilling on the current resource to, and, and that's really to look at increasing our drill classification to indicate it in um, uh, 
uh, measured. And that again, as I said, that will help us bring out those high grade zones that we know are within this whole body um, and uh, look to sort of select, um, selectively report those out of the, of the block model. Um, and all of this work is then got to feed into a PFS that we're sort of getting into now. Um, so uh, we're really looking to fast track this project. It's been 18 months since we picked it up um, and discovered that there was or confirmed that there was a device idea through to our jewel resource. So that's uh, really a, a testament to the, the field team here and the consultants that we're dragging in, everyone sort of pushing together to, uh, to get this job done. Uh, next slide. So in terms of news flow, um, over the next short while, as I said, we're commencing drilling in a couple of weeks' time, so we'll certainly let you know how that's going. Um, the extensions off the north there. We've got new tenements that are coming online um, and uh, hopefully they'll be uh, very shortly being granted and we'll start our regional work there again. We'll keep you all up to date as to what we're seeing as we go because that's going to generate new targets for us. Um, obviously, the commencement of the infill drilling within that, um, within that mineral resource estimate that we've done and results from those and then uh, as we step into the PFS, we'll keep you fully informed as to where we're going with that. Um, I think that's it. Last slide, I think. Next one. Uh, just a bit of a, um, the metrics on the company you can see there with a market cap of around about 89 at that six cents. Um, we're well funded. Uh, we've got you know, over $4 million in cash, no debt. So we can certainly get through all of these next phases of work that we're doing um, uh, very easily. And uh, yeah, it's going to be an exciting time over the next sort of couple of months for us as we get back into doing what we, uh, we like to do best, which is drill holes. Um, so I think that's about it, Tim. Thank, thanks, Tony. Um, lots of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Let's start with, um, given um, the agricultural use of the land near you, um, mm -hmm. will there be problems getting drill access and later a development go ahead? Yeah, look, that's a good question. And um, what we've found, as I said, is we've, we've uh, got a number of farmers that we're dealing with at the moment to, to get to where we are. All of our farmers and, um, have been really accommodating. We've got access agreements to get in and on the ground and do our drilling um, and exploration through there. Um, all of these people understand where we're going with the project in terms of um, you know, fast tracking it and can see the value um, that they're in. So no, I don't expect any issues at all. Obviously, we need to uh, negotiate um, mining agreements if and when we get to the point where we'll be developing this thing. Um, but look, all of our farmers are, are very accommodating and, and go out of their way to um, to help us and uh, make our life easy. So uh, it's good working relationships up to this point, absolutely. And and Tony, Kalen has multiple uses. Um, where where do you start in terms of your target market and, and what's the kind of value of that? Yeah, look, that's again a really good question. Um, you know, obviously, as we sort of, we haven't yet gone down the down the pathway of um, offtake agreements and things like that. It's a bit early stage for the project, um, but you know, base um, the base of commodity here is, as you say, kaolin. It's a very well understood um, market. Um, there's there's a big market for material out there, and certainly when the material that we have is, which is up around that eighty and plus in terms of the brightness, um, this is well sought after material. Um, so uh, those sorts of things uh, certainly bode well for, for those sort of off-tack agreements and those discussions in the future. Um, the Heloi site is, is another one again. Um, this is a very high value commodity. Um, you know, we're talking hundreds of dollars for a Kaolin product versus thousands of dollars for a Heloi site product. So that's certainly a focus for us um, is to understanding where this material is. It's very rare. There's only a, a few projects um, here in Australia and globally, in fact, that have this naturally occurring halosite. Um, so understanding the, the grades and, and the distribution of that, so um, you know, we can then better look to market those products is something that we will need to get our heads around. Um, and that will be sort of coming in the feasibility study. And, and as I said, we'll be looking to infill drill around those high grade areas that we have. Uh, but certainly what we're seeing is um, some of the grades that we're getting coming out of uh, Mervinberry and, and Cloud9 are some of the highest that are being reported here in Australia. So um, it's certainly uh, a, a major focus for us understanding that main hospital already. And, and Tony, we, we've, we had Andromeda on last week, so we've got lots mm -hmm. of questions around uh, peer comparisons. Sure. Uh, where do you see Latin resources uh, in comparison to where Andromeda are at? Yeah, sure. Look, Andromeda certainly have a bit of a head start on this. They're, uh, they're, they're certainly more advanced. They've got measured and indicated resources, but uh, we are going very quickly and closing that gap, um, hopefully um, sooner rather than later. In terms of a global resource, these are very similar projects. Um, brightness is, is around about the same. 
um, you know, the tonnage that we have here at 270 million tonnes was outstanding and we know that's only going to grow. Um, so, you know, without wanting to, you know, we, we have this, they have that, it, it's very difficult to, to make those comparisons. But um, on a global sense, we, uh, as I said, we're very much on par um, with, the, with the combined resources that Andromeda have. Um, we know we've got some very, very high grade um, holocyte material within our ore body. Um, certainly some of the highest reported that I've seen um, in Australia from any, from any project. Um, so again, that bodes very well for us. Um, and we'll be working to understand those higher grade zones uh, more so we can then report those out more selectively as I've said. And, and finally, just quickly, Tony, access to water, that's important. Mm. Yeah, look, absolutely. This, as I said, the main you know, cable pipeline's running through the northern part of the project there. But we, uh, you know, because we're, we're launching um, in, into our pre visibility studies, one of those um, areas of, um, of work is going to be water. So, hydrogeological studies and things like that. Um, you know, obviously uh, important to make sure we tick all those boxes as we go forward with that. Um, the use of water for the project itself uh, through the development. Um, there are a number of projects around that are using dry processing as a, as a starter. Um, we haven't yet gone too far down the path of what we'll be doing on site, you know, you know potentially when we, if we develop this thing. Um, so, you know, all of those things need to be sort of taken into consideration, but you're right, water is, is certainly something that we will need to look at very closely um, and, uh, and we will be doing that as part of any sort of future studies as we move forward. Great, Tony. Uh, that's all we have time for. Have a great weekend. No worries. Thanks very much, Tim. Now, before anyone goes, we have the uh, new webinar details for next week. Brain chip, Imugene, Race Oncology, Ordera Headphones, which is a new company just listed. So if I was you, I would register now because we have limited spots available. Have a good weekend.